pleasure to meet you. Welcome to Turkey. Uh, I'm Berivan, uh, working as a gynecologist and obstetrician uh, at a public hospital in Turkey. And uh, I'm an endospecialist in uh, Turkish endometriosis and adenomyosis society. Uh, today, I'm excited to uh, embark and, uh, on an enlightened conversation with a prominent figure in uh, reproductive science and endometriosis. Her contribution to the field of reproductive science and endometriosis are noteworthy. Uh, Dr. Lucy Whitaker, who is a senior clinical research fellow and honorary consultant gynecologist at the University of Edinburgh, uh, she will share valuable insight into her career, areas of expertise and current developments in the industry. Uh, Dr. Whitaker, welcome and thank you for being us today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to be in Istanbul. Thank you. Uh, to start off, Dr. Lucy H.R. Whitaker uh, is a distinguished figure. She serves as a senior clinical research fellow and honorary consultant gynecologist, right? So, yeah, uh, at the University of Edinburgh, uh, with a specific, fo uh, specific focus on uh, researching endometriosis. Her research interests are focused on managing chronic conditions uh, across the reproductive science. Uh, especially chronic pelvic pain. Okay, uh, as we transition this section about Dr. Whitaker's background, let's deal into uh, experience and key milestones that have played a significant role in shaping her career. Dr. Whitaker, could you share with us a bit about your career journey and your background uh, and the primary areas uh, of research that have captured your attention throughout the years? Of course. Um, so I am a clinical academic and I trained in the UK. So I went to university in Edinburgh and whilst I was an undergraduate, my tutor for obstetrics and gynaecology was Professor Andrew Horn, who at the time said, I think you should do obs and gynae. And I said, no, I want to be a proper surgeon. Um, <laughs> but then I graduated from medical school and I did my first two years of, of uh, junior doctoring jobs doing a combination of medicine and surgery. And I still really enjoyed surgery, but I also wanted to do more than just operate. It wanted to have more of a holistic approach to care to patients. And I then moved to New Zealand for two years mm -hmm. and I worked in Christchurch Women's Hospital in their obstetrics and gynaecology department there. Mm -hmm. And it was a very forward thinking unit. They had a specialist pelvic pain and endometriosis service. Mm -hmm. And that was where I was, became completely certain that I wanted to be a gynaecologist in my career. So I returned to the UK and started the OBGYN training program there again back in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, and throughout my clinical training, I did advanced laparoscopy training for endometriosis for the last four years of my career, along my, last four years of my training. And alongside that, I also had additional training in menopause care. But alongside that, I've also had my academic training. So when I was a junior uh, gynaecology trainee, I took, undertook a master's in surgical sciences. And my dissertation was around chronic pelvic pain and particularly the role of neuropathic pain with endometriosis. And I then took two and a half years out of time out of my training to do uh, a doctorate um, a thesis. And for that, I moved groups. So my master had been with Andrew Horn, and then I worked with Professor Hilary Critchley. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was laboratory studies looking at the impact on the selective progesterone receptor modulator Unipristal on the female reproductive tract. So there's laboratory based studies. But alongside that, I worked for two clinical trials of medical interventions for heavy menstrual bleeding. And that was where I really had my first proper exposure to clinical trials, which I realized was the area that I wanted to work in. But my first love was always pelvic pain and endometriosis. So once I'd completed my doctorate, I went back to doing uh, research within endometriosis and pelvic pain, working with Andrew Horn on predominantly on clinical trials for endometriosis and pelvic pain. And that's when I got my lectureship post. And then once I completed my lectureship, I've now got an academic post with the university, uh, but still have clinical work caring for patients with endometriosis. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Whitaker, what notable challenge or significant turning points have you encountered in your career? Um, how have these experiences shaped you and uh, what impact have they had on your career? So I think some of the really important 
turning points was securing funding to go and do my doctorate, for some funding for my lectureship, and funding for some of my clinical trials. Um, but I think other key factors has also been the things I haven't got. I think, you know, resilience is a really important part of a, cl a clinical academic's career. Mm -hmm. And so being able to take feedback when you apply for research programs or you put a paper in or you apply for a grant and you don't get it, yeah. learning from that how to then make it a better application or a better paper um, is, is really important in having a worthwhile career. I think the other important factor has been the support I've had from different mentors along my career path and I've been very fortunate based in Edinburgh which has got a very strong history of research within reproductive sciences and women's health and so I've been very fortunate to have exposure from Andrew Horn and Hilary Critchley but I think also some of those collaborations I've made over the years particularly through organisations such as the World Endometriosis Society has allowed me to have really important advice and mentorship from other clinicians and academics all over the world really, who've also then offered the opportunity to collaborate with them on different studies throughout the time. So I think it's, there are, sometimes there's a little bit of luck in being in the right place at the right time, but I think also if you work hard, you'll often make your own luck as well. Uh, your research has prominently focused on managing chronic conditions, particularly chronic pelvic pain, specifically associated with endometriosis. Can you elaborate on how your work contributes to addressing these significant issues and what challenges are you aimed to tackle? So, in terms of my research to date, I've been very involved in some trials like the GAP2 trial, which looked at gabapentin for chronic pelvic pain. Um, I've been involved in early pregnancy trials, um, looking at a drug called gefitinib for ectopic pregnancy. Um, but those studies have both been of interventions which were subsequently shown not to help those conditions, but it was very useful for me in my training. But in terms of the trials that I've been involved in that have led on to change or have supported trials to change, I think two of the studies I was really proud to be part of was a study called the EPIC, uh, which was, uh, the, so that was a, a the very preliminary first in patients with endometriosis of giving them a drug called dichloracetate. And the outcomes of that study has then allowed us to get much more funding to do a larger trial, which is I'm leading, which will be starting in the UK later on this year. Um, so that gave some really exciting preliminary data that this drug, which is a non-hormonal treatment, could be effective for helping women with, pelvic, with endometriosis. And the other trial that we've now completed that I'm really proud of is a trial called the Esprit One trial. Mm -hmm. um, so this is looking at trying to determine the role of surgery to remove superficial endometriosis to try and improve endometriosis associated pain. Now Epic, Esprit One is not the definitive trial, that's Esprit Two which we're running at the moment. Mm -hmm. But Esprit One was a trial that made us confident that we would be able to recruit women to that type of study and that was really pivotal in enabling us to get over £2 million worth of funding from the UK research organisations to support yeah. the Esprit 2 trial, which I do think is going to change our practice. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, you talk about uh, EPIC and Esprit uh, and Indocaine, I, I know, and Envisions, right? Yeah, Envisions, yeah. Um, they are uh, supported by the uh, prestige organisation like the Chief Science Office well-being uh, of Women Project Grant, National Institute for Health Research, right? Uh, and Roche Diagnostics. Mm -hmm. This project aims to evaluate innovative treatments and contribute significantly to understand pain associated with endometriosis. Uh, could you share your insights on the importance of these projects and their potential impacts on the field, specifying how they advance our understanding of endometriosis pain? So EPIC2 and Endocan are two separate uh, medical trials and what's really important about these studies is that both of them are non-hormonal medical treatments for endometriosis. Mm -hmm. So EPIC2 is looking at dichloracetate and Endocan is looking at cannabidiol. We know a lot of our patients have started accessing cannabis-based med medicines, but there's very limited evidence for that. Um, and so I think it's really important we understand which of those compounds might be helpful, which aren't, and also what are the side effects and risks associated with them. 
So both those two trials are pilot studies to understand you know, the feasibility and the design of then hopefully going on to do much larger trials to definitively answer the role of those two compounds. Envision is a collaboration with Roche Diagnostics, um, utilising samples from our Esprit 2 trial to try and improve biomarker discovery within endometriosis, particularly superficial endometriosis, which is such a challenge for diagnosis because unlike deep endometriosis and ovarian endometriosis, superficial disease really can't be identified reliably with imaging techniques, so we're very dependent on surgery to diagnose it. And we know that that's a big barrier to diagnosis and why our patients have to wait such a long time for diagnosis. So anything we can do to help move forward um, non-invasive biomarkers is really important. And I think one of the challenges of biomarker discovery in the past is that those studies were done on quite small populations that often weren't uh, necessarily that well defined. So Esprit 2, which we're going to be recruiting over a thousand women to, is a very, very well defined but also large population which makes it um, a really rich resource for biomarker to study. And then the trial that I am really excited about is the Esprit 2 trial, which is a UK-wide uh, surgical trial to look at the role of surgery for super to remove superficial endometriosis because we know that from our day-to-day -day practice, you and I both know that yeah. some of our patients will get better, mm -hmm. some of them won't, mm -hmm. or some of them will have benefit, but not for very long. And we know that that surgery is, comes with risks. And so there is a real need to better understand what the evidence is for surgery, for specifically for peritoneal endometriosis. I think deep disease and endometrioma, there is more evidence, but for peritoneal disease, our current trials are extremely small, and that's why the Cochrane guidelines are very clear that they are uncertain of the role for surgery for superficial disease. So Esprit 2 is running all over the UK. Uh, we are aiming to randomise 400 patients who have superficial endometriosis found at the time of their laparoscopy, so we need to recruit many more than 400 because we know not all of them will have endometriosis and half of those patients will get their endometriosis removed and half of them won't and they won't be told what's happened and where the primary outcome of that trial is um, at 12 months improvement in the end a condition specific endometriosis health profile mm -hmm. and i am really really proud of the progress of this trial we will finish recruitment by the end of 2024 and whatever the outcome of this trial is, it will be very important for our practice. So if it shows that surgery does help pain, mm -hmm. it will allow us to better counsel our patients, mm -hmm. we'll be able to tell them about risks, but also the benefits. Mm -hmm. And if it shows that there is a strong benefit for surgery, then that will have an implication of how we organise our services to offer care. Equally, it may show that surgery doesn't help for everyone, and, can, and in which case we need to consider about where surgery sits within our treatment pathways and actually whether or not we should be focusing more on pain management. Or the answer might be somewhere in the middle and then it says that there are certain groups that benefit from surgery and certain groups that don't. But I hope it will allow us to predict better who will benefit and who won't so that we only offer surgery to the patients who is likely to be helpful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, as a young researcher, I impressed very much. They are very big projects. Uh, it's a very much a team effort though. I don't yeah, do this on my own. I work with a brilliant team within Edinburgh, also clinical trials units, and I have you know, now got collaborations all across the UK yeah, to teacher. ensure that this trial that delivers. Yeah. Okay, as a dedicated professional in reproductive science, especially uh, for the, uh, those interested in endometrial research, what valuable guidance would you offer the young researcher like me? <laughs> Your experience and uh, the roles you have played in the various projects bring a wealth of knowledge, making your uh, perspective ex exceptionally valuable. Um, so I think there are several important factors. One, don't seven. <laughs> no, several. Actually, I, probably okay. do, I probably do have seven. Okay. <laughs> I think the, one of the key things is find a mentor, someone who can supervise you and give you advice, because there are many easy mistakes to make and actually people have made them before and if they can guide you to say actually think about doing it this way rather than that way. I think secondly, work out what your research questions are and that I think one of the good things for clinical academics is that we are faced with the problem every day in the patients that we see. So think about your research question, is it important to you, is it important to your patients, 
do your literature review, find out if someone's already yeah, done it, and then think carefully about the design of how you might answer that research question. Um, I think there is also a need to be strategic. Our jobs are really busy. There is so much we need to learn from our surgical training to our medical training, our communication skills. We all have lives outside of medicine, our families are important. Yeah. And so that, that precious time you have for research, you want to use it really effectively. So I think sometimes it's not necessarily about taking on many, many different projects. Yeah. Do a few, but do them really well and make sure you complete them and you publish them. So be strategic and sometimes it's also about saying no to things rather than saying yes. But I think that's where having a good mentor and a guide is really important to help you to be able to sift out what's going to be a good project to do and what's going to be, yeah. might be helpful for someone else, but actually might not be helpful for you. <laughs> you explained everything. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, looking ahead, what are your future aspiration and expectation in the field of endometriosis, especially regarding the management of chronic condition and the advancement of precision treatments? And are there any specific projects you are excited to work on? So I think endometriosis, is, the research field is changing quite quickly at the moment. And I think we've all acknowledged that it's only by better understanding of the disease and funding to support that, that we're going to move forward our treatment of care. I think we need to move away a model of one size fits all medicine surgery, but about identifying which particular patient is going to benefit from which treatment so we can give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And I think part of that needs to be driven by disease subtype. So instead of thinking just about endometriosis, what is it superficial disease? Is it deep disease? We also need to consider what symptoms they've got, what comorbidities they've got, because that impacts upon our treatments. But I think the world, the area of pharmacogenomics is really interesting about, it's not just necessarily about the disease and the symptoms, but how that individual's genetic makeup will impact upon how they will respond to a treatment or perhaps the risk of side effects. And so I think if we look where breast cancer was 30 years ago, that's kind of where <laughs> we're at now with endometriosis. But we've seen what better understanding of genetics, the etiology and pathogenesis, um, really has changed things. I think one of the things that has held us back is the lack of good biomarkers, um, which means that we still don't really fully understand the natural history. But I think the biomarker world is so rapidly evolving, I think we're not that far away from having biomarkers that will give us those insights into the disease process. I think we also are much more aware that we need to do research with our patients rather than for them and having their voices within our research design, our research priorities, but also how we communicate them and their acceptability will mean that there'll be less research wastage along the way. So I'm really optimistic. I think we all recognise that it needs funded. And if Turkey is anything like the UK, there's not much money for women's health. But I think it's also why the importance of collaboration is so important. Um, and not just within one country, but across countries, across continents, because I think variation across different countries means that there is inequity of care yeah. and access to treatment. So we need to, for our trials, make sure that they're applicable to all the populations affected by endometriosis. Thank you. Dr. Utega, for general sharing your expertise and opening research efforts, thank you very much. Uh, your commitment to advancing our understanding of chronic condition, particularly in advancing our understanding of endometriosis, is truly impressive. Uh, we appreciate your pursuit in innovative treatments and look forward to following your future in the race. And your valuable insights have provided us with a significant glimpse into the advancement in reproductive science. Uh, I believe the information you shared will serve as an inspiration for young researchers and those interested in this field. Uh, thank you for taking time to speak with us. My absolute pleasure. And the only thing I haven't mentioned, which I would mention, is it's that importance of collaboration and you've got a fantastic organisation in Turkey That's but I think you should also look more okay. widely and particularly the World Endometriosis Society is a wonderful way to collaborate 
f even further than to across Turkey and particularly as early career ambassadors, early career board members, um, it's, it's a wonderful way to identify mentors and support across the globe which I think is a huge resource. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs>